I had determined that I would not even attempt to preach through the book of Romans until I was at least 50. I mean, I actually became relatively well known for saying that a number of years back. And so when I announced uh, to our team and to other staff members and friends who heard me say that years ago and heard me say it over and over, when I announced that I would be preaching through the book of Romans, they looked at me kind of puzzled, like, I thought you were going to wait to do that. And I said, that was my initial plan, to wait. It is such a thick book. It is so important. It is absolutely foundational to the Christian faith. Everything Paul wants to say about God and sin and grace and salvation and all of those things are found here in the book of Romans. And so I just didn't feel up to the task. But a number of months ago, uh, end of November, early December, I was just having a rough week and going through a rough season. And what brought that rough season on really was this ongoing nagging in my own heart regarding the gospel. You know, the gospel, the good news of what Jesus has done for train wrecks like you and me is impossible to believe on our own. We're constantly struggling with unbelief. We're constantly thinking that we can now move past it. We're constantly deceiving ourselves into thinking we're not so bad that we need to hear the gospel over and over and over again. The gospel is something that we can move past, that we can move beyond. And so not only do I wrestle with those things internally, but when you commit yourself to saying the same thing over and over and over again in a thousand different ways, because the Bible itself says the same thing over and over and over again in a thousand different ways, that we never grow beyond the gospel, but we only grow more deeply into the gospel. When you're committed to saying that, you get pushback. I mean, it's inevitable. You'll get pushback from people who will say, okay, I get it. Can we move on now? We keep hearing the same thing. And so you combine that sort of external criticism with the internal unbelief. And I was at the end of November, early December going, is any of this true? You know, preachers ask those questions too. Is any of this really true? I mean, is it really true? It's so mind-blowing that can it possibly be true? Am I off track here? Am I believing a lie? Am I preaching a lie? And the only thing I knew how to do was one morning when I woke up in just despair, literally. I mean, I was, not to freak you out or anything, I feel like I'm a relatively stable person emotionally. Um, so don't come to me and recommend all sorts of drugs that might be able to help me. Um, but, you know, uh, I literally woke up one morning and said, I need help. I need help. And so I look at my bedside table, and I, was, I wasn't ready to walk away, don't get me wrong, uh, but I was really going, is this, I'm tired? I'm tired emotionally, I'm tired spiritually, I'm tired intellectually, I'm tired physically. I just don't know if I have it in me to do this anymore. And going and working at Home Depot started becoming a very, very attractive option for me. Even though I hate home, I was like, <laughs> I wanted something so different that I said Home Depot was about, working at Home Depot was about as different from being a preacher as anything on the planet. Um, and so I grabbed my Bible and I opened it to Romans chapter one and I sat in my bed and read the first six chapters in one sitting. And I promise you, it was miraculous by the time it took me, you know, maybe 30 minutes by the time I had finished reading 
and gotten to the end of Romans chapter 6, I mean, I had been lifted out of the pit. The, the sunshine was shining bright back in my soul. I felt like I had been set free and rescued all over again. And it was in that moment that I said, I got to preach through this book for me. I have to go through this book for me. I have to prepare sermons and preach sermons from this unbelievable letter for me. And if it helps you, good. But this is for me. And I know that sounds terribly selfish, but let me tell you something. One of the reasons I am a sinner like you and one of the reasons that I preach with Conviction and passion is because I'm doing everything I can to convince myself as much as convince you when I'm preaching. I struggle with unbelief just like you do. All of this stuff sounds too good to be true to me also. And I have to constantly go, be going back to the radicality of this mind-blowing good news in order to be set free day after day after day after day. And so as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago when I was talking about the job description of the pulpit, what is the job description of the pulpit? In other words, is the pulpit a lectern and you all are a classroom? Is the pulpit a counselor's couch and you're in the therapist's office? Or is the pulpit something different? And I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that the pulpit has a singular job description to diagnose and deliver slaves and sinners. And there is nothing, in my opinion, there is no letter, in my opinion, in the Bible that so explicitly and clearly diagnoses slaves and delivers slaves that diagnoses us as being sinners and then delivers us from our sin like the letter, Paul's letter to the book of Romans. This is a sermon. In fact, I'll show you in just a few moments that this really is a sermon. Paul, who wants to go to Rome and has been, as he mentioned in what I just read, he has been prevented from doing so. He wants to go to Rome on his way to Spain Spain is about as far away as you can get from where Paul's ministry had been. He is taking Jesus' words very seriously to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And the farthest place he knows is Spain. And he wants Rome to be sort of a home base for him so that he can get the support both spiritually and financially so that he can eventually go to Spain. But he's been prevented from even going to Rome. And so what he does here is he introduces himself and says, my name's Paul and this is the gospel. This is the gospel that I have been preaching. This is the gospel that I'm coming to you to preach. And this is the same gospel that I want to eventually make it to Spain and preach. So it's a sermon. He's not, it's not like First and Second Corinthians where he's addressing problems in the church that he's become aware of. Um, you know, it's not like Galatians. It's, it's very similar to Galatians in its content, but he's not addressing a specific problem or a specific issue. He's saying, this is what I'm coming to preach to you. And since you can't hear it from me in person, I'm writing it down. When I get there in person, I'm going to say the stuff that's here. I want you to hear the gospel from me. And so... What we'll discover as we make our way through this letter is that this really is one long sermon. This is Paul describing the foundation, the nature of the Christian faith. This is Paul diagnosing all human beings as sinners and slaves. And then announcing Jesus who came to deliver sinners and slaves. That's what he does here. That's what he does and then when you get to chapter 12 and onward, he says, okay, I have diagnosed you. I have announced Jesus as the deliverer of sinners and slaves. And now I want to describe for you what the free life looks like. I want to describe. So it's almost, you know, you could almost divide the book into three parts. The first part of the book is diagnosis. The second part of the book is deliverance. The third part of the book is description. 
And that he's really describing what, what the free life looks like, what it looks like to love your neighbor. And he describes the free life really in terms of love. What, is it, what does it begin to look like when you stop needing for yourself and giving your life for others? What does that look like? How does that really show itself in everyday life? And so um, Romans really is, as you make your way through the book, Romans is 200 proof good news. I mean, everything I love, everything I say can be found here. Everything that God has done to save me can be described here. Everything that God has done to save you can be described right here. This describes you. Paul, as I said, diagnoses you. By the time you get to the end of chapter 3, all of us stand condemned. I mean, all of us stand condemned. It doesn't matter who you are, church person, non-church person. You know, he describes all nationalities, all cultural backgrounds, whether you're religious, not religious, whatever. The human race is guilty before God. And by the time you get to end of chapter 3, you're going, I'm in trouble. I'm in big, big trouble. And then he begins describing the deliverance that God gives to sinners for free because of what Jesus has done Uh, So Romans really is our missive as a church. I mean, from the fount of Romans gushes everything we love and say as a church. Um, And as I mentioned, it was Luther's reading of Romans that launched the first Reformation. And if we ever hope to experience a new Reformation, and trust me, we need one. Lots and lots of Protestants today are sounding a lot like the Roman Catholics back in Martin Luther's day. You just can't say Jesus plus nothing equals everything. What will happen to society? What will happen to Christian people and non-Christian people if you simply announce it is finished? You can't say that. That sounds identical to the Roman Catholic criticism of Martin Luther back in the day. Identical. So we need a new reformation. And if we are ever going to experience one, it's going to be as a result of getting back to the mind-blowing basics of Romans. Um, But we have our work cut out for us. Let me read you. This may be one of the most descriptive, poetic paragraphs I have ever read concerning the book of Romans written by a guy that I have quoted before and a guy that is now dead, but I have enjoyed many of his books named Robert Capon. Listen to this, just poetic. The epistle to the Romans has sat around in the church since the first century like a bomb ticking away the death of religion. And every time it's been picked up, the ear-splitting freedom in it has gone off with a roar. The only sad thing is that the church as an institution has spent most of its time playing bomb squad and trying to defuse it. For your comfort, though, it cannot be done. Your freedom remains as close to your life as Jesus and as available to your understanding as the nearest copy of Romans. Like Augustine, therefore, take and read and then hold on to your hat. Compared to that explosion, the clap of doom sounds like a cap pistol. So what is he saying? He's saying, I love his description of the church as addicted to playing bomb squad. This is a bomb. And if this thing goes off like it did in 1517, things won't be the same for the church or for you. And he said, the problem with this, however, is that because it's so dangerous and scary because of the effect that it has always had. The church, because we just love safety and those things that we can control, uh, has been playing bomb squad for centuries, trying to defuse it. Capon goes on to say, but it can't be done. I mean, no matter what we do to try and stop the explosion of Romans, it cannot be done. I was um, emailing back and forth with uh, John O'Linebaugh, who's 
uh, one of our professors over at Knox Theological Seminary across the street. And I showed him, a, I sent him the, a link to an article that someone had written this past week, which drove me nuts. So whenever I want to complain about bad theology, I send it to Jono, and he always makes me feel better. And, um, and it was one of those yes, grace, but articles, you know, it was, it was literally, I mean, I think somewhere in the article it was like, yes, grace, but literally I was like, dude, this is exactly what I'm talking about. He actually says it. So anyway, um, so I sent it to him and I said, Do you see this? He said, no, but I read it. And this is what he said back. So Jono, if you're here, I hope you don't mind me reading this personal correspondence that you gave me yesterday. After he talks about how unhappy his marriage is and what a problem his kids are. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> After he tells me about his problems with addiction and all that stuff, he gets to the point of his email. I'm just kidding. Totally kidding. His wife's never going to forgive me now. Um, this is his response, which I thought was equally poetic to what Capon said. The theological plumbing in the church these days is fixed in such a way that if you try to pour the pure water of mercy down the pipe of people's hearts, it backs up. And the theological plumber gets called to come clear the clog with the plunger of a few ifs and buts. I'm convinced, he wrote, the old plumbing has to be totally replaced, not repaired, and this only happens when it fully breaks through suffering and failure, not arguments. Who are the people who are most ready to hear the radicality of God's one-way love? People who have crashed and burned. People who... People for whom life has broken them, they come to the realization that they're not as in control as they thought they were. Things aren't panning out the way they thought they would. Something has happened where they are flat on their back and the only way out is up. And they're so broken and aware of their brokenness, they're so desperate and aware of their desperation that they're finally ready to hear it is finished. And the gospel, perhaps for the first time, finally sounds like good news. Finally sounds like good news. So Romans is not just Paul writing a letter about the gospel. Romans is Paul's proclamation of the gospel. In other words, as I mentioned, it's a sermon. So in these verses here, Paul identifies two things. He identifies the subject of the gospel, and he identifies the object of the gospel. The subject of the gospel is Jesus, not you, and I'll unpack that in a moment. The object of the gospel is you, not Jesus, and I'll unpack that in a moment, okay? So um, the subject of the gospel is Jesus. It's about him. It's who he is. The gospel is a person, and it's not you. The object of the gospel is you. The object of the gospel is sinners. So Paul here, first the subject of the gospel, Paul here introduces himself by calling himself an apostle, someone set apart for the gospel of God. And then he tells the Romans and us what the gospel of God is. And he begins in verse 3 after he says, um, uh, excuse me, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, and then he describes the gospel, which he promised this gospel beforehand through his prophets and the holy scriptures concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ. So he says something pretty profound here, believe it or not. He says, the gospel is a person. And that person is not you. That person is Jesus. And this is really, really important because it locates good news outside of you, which is completely counterintuitive 
to the way the world and lots of the church wants you to think about you. The good news is not dig down deep and muster up the hero within so that you can have your best life now. That's not good news. That's not the gospel. He squarely locates the gospel outside of you, not inside of you. The gospel is not your life. It's not what you do. It's not what you can accomplish. The gospel is not, this is who I am and this is what I'm becoming. That's not the gospel. The gospel is outside of us. And he says, everything he says here regarding Jesus, he says, happened independent and outside of them. And he locates this Jesus both historically and biologically. He says, this is historically outside of you. It's biologically outside of you. Everything about this good news that I'm getting ready to share with you is embodied in the person and work of Jesus. Completely outside of you. As we get into it next week, what we'll discover is that when we look inside of us, all we find is bad news. It's only when we look outside of us that we see good news, that we hear good news. So the gospel is not what you do and who you can or should become. The gospel is what Jesus has done. The gospel is what Jesus has become for you. Now, saying this might frustrate us initially, but it frees us eventually because the best news is that we can't do it on our own, that we can't make it on our own. And that initially frustrates us, especially if we're somewhat accomplished, especially if we look around at our lives and we see good things happening. You know, our kids aren't really going off the deep end and our health is pretty good and our marriage is fairly stable. And, you know, I haven't lost my job. I actually have, you know, spending money. I've got some financial margin and, you know, I'm careful about making sure my family's in church every Sunday and those sorts of things. You look around at your life and you think things look pretty good, that everything seems to be going okay. Um, And it's just almost impossible Almost impossible for you at some point not to go, I've done this. You know, because I've been faithful and because I've been good and because I've done the right thing, I've done this. And grace at that point ceases to be amazing to you. This happened to me. When God saved me at 21 years old, I was a complete train wreck, as I've shared with you before. And His saving of me, his rescuing of me was so radical that I literally could not sing a song or hear a sermon in church or even hear someone talk about God's grace without literally weeping. And I wasn't much of a weeper. I wasn't much of a crier. And I just couldn't hear about it. I would literally sit in church and we would be singing something about God's grace and I would just, I couldn't sing anymore. I was asked to give my testimony on a couple of occasions in those early days and share with people what God had done in my life. I couldn't get through it. I would listen to sermons about God's grace and his mercy, and I just could not. I was overwhelmed. And then I started to get better. Literally, I started, I stopped hanging out with the people I was hanging out with. I stopped doing the things that I had been doing for years. I started going to Bible studies and hanging out with Christians and reading my Bible and going to bed and praying and waking up and praying first thing and started watching the way that I talked and watching the way that I lived and I actually started to become better. And after a while, God's, I I could hear songs about God's grace. I could hear sermons about God's grace. I could give my testimony regarding God's grace in my own life. And I wasn't crying anymore because something subtle had happened. The Christian faith for me had gone from this whole thing's about Jesus and his grace and his mercy and his work and his performance for me. It's all about the gracious hound of heaven who tracked this rebel down and defeated him. That's what I That's what was so captivating to me, his forbearance, his patience, his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, all of those things is what 
just warmed my heart and wooed me into service. But a shift happened as I started to get better on the outside. And the Christian faith stopped being all about Jesus and his work for me, and it started to become all about me and my work for him. How I was performing, what I was doing. I became a sin manager in my own life. That was what the Christian life was all about. Get stronger and stronger and better and better and better. And as a result, something terribly unsanctifying happened to me. I ceased being amazed at God's grace because I started to locate good news inside of me. I started to look down deep inside of me and deceiving myself into thinking, I'm pretty good, you know? And I stopped looking outside of me. I stopped, I stopped believing that I was desperate, and therefore I stopped believing that I needed deliverance each and every day. Because I was actually, Jesus got me in, and I thanked him for that. Thanks for getting me in the door. I'll take it from here. Thanks for, thanks for starting me out, I'll finish. That was the way my life had gone. Well, you suffer enough and uh, you crash and you burn enough and your kids become teenagers <laughs> and all of a sudden you become reacquainted with desperation. You know, father dies, people leave you, Things start happening. Life isn't panning out the way you wanted it to. You make some bad decisions. You do some bad things. God has a way of reacquainting us with our desperation. And he does so, so that we can become radically reacquainted with his deliverance. Because that's where the freedom is. Freedom is not found in you're getting better, do it yourself. Freedom is not found in do-it-yourself Christianity or living. It's found in it is finished Christianity and living. That I am a desperate sinner and he, I remain a desperate sinner and he remains a delivering savior each and every day. So saying that the gospel is not about what you do and who you can or should become is initially frustrating, but it frees us eventually because the best news is that we can't do it on our own. We can't make it on our own. And this means that the pressure is off. Good news relieves you and it lightens you. You know you've heard good news when it causes you to exhale rather than hold your breath and bite your nails. Too many people leave church on Sunday mornings holding their breath and biting their nails instead of going, oh, Thank God. I've said this before, but if people leave church thinking more about what would Jesus do instead of what has Jesus done, you haven't heard the gospel. The gospel is good news and it is intended to make you feel relieved. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Sunday, after Sunday, after Sunday, after Sunday. And the reason we need to get back to the message of Romans is because all too often, weary and heavy laden people who desperately need rest come to church and instead they get a to-do list. And the Christian faith becomes all about their Christian life and not about what Jesus has done. And it's only when we have been gripped transformed by the doneness of Jesus' work for us that will actually start loving God and loving our neighbor. Those things that we're actually called to do. We won't do those things if we're obsessed with ourselves. We won't do those things if we're constantly thinking about how we're doing and whether or not we're doing it right. I call it spiritualized navel-gazing. You know, spiritual narcissism, we're so obsessed with what we need to do and what we're not doing that we fail to identify the needs of our neighbors and serve those needs, which is what God calls us to do. So it's when our hearts have been gripped by done and we realize everything we need in Christ we have, now I can identify your needs and serve them, which according to Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. When I got the call back in November that Gabe, my oldest, had been in an accident. 
And some of you know about that. Dwayne Miller was gracious enough to take my call Saturday afternoon when I said, you're preaching tomorrow, buddy. I'm on my way to a scene of an accident. Um, when I got the call, I was working on my sermon uh, Saturday afternoon. Gabe calls. He was home for Christmas break and calls, and he's hysterical. Can't even get a word out. And I'm like, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? And of course, I feared the worst. And he said, uh, something really bad has happened. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, my mind was racing. And I said, what happened? And he could barely get it out, but he finally got it out. He said, I, we got in a bad car wreck. And my heart just sank. I'm literally thinking, you know, he's mangled, someone's dead. If he's this hysterical, something really bad has happened. Um, but when he informed me on the phone that he and everyone else was okay, it felt like a huge weight had been lifted off of my shoulders. I mean, it was bad news that he got in an accident, don't get me wrong. But when you fear the worst, and then he gives you good news, everyone's okay. No one is hurt. No one's, you know, I mean, there were some bumps and bruises on one person, but no one's really hurt. We're all okay. Nobody's dead. I mean, that was huge. You and I both know the impact that hearing good news has. And the church should be a place where good news is found in abundance. Preachers are called to be good news specialists. And so, and you know when you've heard it, regardless of what people say, you know when you've heard it because there is a sense of relief. There is just this sense that the heavy weight on my shoulders has been lifted. It's not as bad as I thought. Thank God. We've all been on the receiving end of that. My friend Justin Buzzard has said before, Christianity should feel like my chains fell off, not I better get it right. And for too many people, both inside and outside the church, Christianity represents I better get it right, not my chains fell off, my heart was free, I rose, went forth, and followed thee. It just doesn't feel that way. You know it. Regardless of what someone is saying to you with their mouth, you know. You know when you've heard good news. You know the impact that it has on you mentally and emotionally when you've heard it, when you have feared the worst, when you've gone in for tests and you have feared that the tests were going to come back positive and you get the call and the tests come back negative. You know what that feels like. It's a huge relief. It almost feels like you've been given a second lease on life. You should walk away from Sunday morning feeling like you've been given a second lease on life every single Sunday because my job is to, every single Sunday, re-diagnose you and remind you that you have cancer, every one of you, and then announce Jesus, the great physician who came to do for you what you could never do for yourself. So that by the time you're walking out of here, you're going, I feel lighter. I, I exhale. I'm not biting my nails. I'm not, you know, wishing this were true. I feel lighter. And that leads to a life of service. Not licentiousness, and no, now I can serve me. You're not even worried about you anymore because Jesus has paid it all. So the gospel, Paul wants to make it very clear, is about Jesus. It's not about your improvement. It's about Jesus' imputation. It's not about your transformation. It's about Jesus' substitution. It's not about your progress. It's about Jesus' perfection. That's what the gospel is. Squarely located outside of you. It's about him what he's done, his performance, his work on behalf of sinners like you and me. But while the gospel is not about you, Jesus is the subject of the gospel, it is for you. You are, sinners are, the object of the gospel. Saying that the gospel is Jesus isn't enough, which is what Paul does here, which is in verses 1 through 4, he says, the gospel is Jesus. But he doesn't stop there. 
Just saying, well, the gospel is Jesus. It's not, it's not enough. In verses 1 through 4, Paul gives us a biographical description of Jesus, but then he transitions in verse 5 to 7 from who Jesus was to what he came to do, and specifically who he came to do it for. And I read that earlier when he says, beginning in verse 5, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So he goes in verse 1 to 4 to describing who Jesus is biographically. He's the content of the gospel to saying, what he came to do, and specifically who he came to do it for. You see, there's a huge difference between hearing that someone you don't know got into a car accident and didn't die, which is good news, and hearing that your son got into a car accident and didn't die. There's a difference. I know that difference. You know that difference. It's not that you don't, when I hear about someone who got into a car accident and didn't die, I'm relieved. That's good news to me. I hate hearing about someone who gets into a car accident and dies, especially if I know them, even a little. But there's a difference between hearing that someone got in a car accident and didn't die and hearing that Gabe got in a car accident and didn't die. To me, there's something that is more personal. And you can say, well, that's just mean. You should care about both the same. Come on. You know, give me a break. Um, none of you are that righteous. Um, I mean, there is something about knowing that it's not just good news, but this good news is for me. That kind of changes the game a little bit. Both are good news, but one is much more personal than the other. It's not simply good news for someone, it's good news for me. On Friday night, I went to see Lone Survivor, the movie. If you ever want to know what movie to see or not see, come to me because I've seen them all. The, the movie theater is across the street from my house. I'm getting old and tired and there's nothing I enjoy more than going to a movie by myself and sitting in a dark room to be entertained without having to talk to anybody. So I go to lots of movies, all right? Um, <laughs> and so I went to see Lone Survivor. I don't know, some of you may have seen it. It's a story about, based on a true story, um, about four Navy SEALs uh, who uh, went into Afghanistan. And I won't tell you the end of the story, but only one guy comes out alive. Sorry. <laughs> Ruins the illustration if I don't at least tell you that. Um, it was gripping. I mean, it was gripping. It was, I had to close my eyes three times because I just can't handle gore. And I knew that, you know, when, when war happens, blood happens and guts happens. And I have a very limited stomach for that. My wife, on the other hand, loves watching that stuff. She actually watches like surgeries on television. You know, those stations where they're like pulling people's guts out and doing heart surgery and brain surgery. She loves that stuff. She goes and makes popcorn and sits down and eats and watches this stuff. <laughs> I can't even be in the same room. I'm like, this is so, you know, ba people giving birth to babies. And I mean, the whole, I just, I don't even know what station it is, but I want it removed from my cable plan. It's disgusting. So I don't have a, I don't have a very, I have a very weak stomach for that stuff. So I closed my eyes three times. Um, but it was gripping, very gripping. And it was amazing to me, even as a watcher of the movie, that when, the one, because you get so emotionally involved in these four guys and their love for one another and their love for their country and what they're willing to do to sacrifice themselves uh, is unbelievable. It's so gripping. And um, even as a movie watcher, knowing that it's just a movie in this particular case, even though it was based on a true story, when the one made it home alive, I was relieved. As a moviegoer, I was relieved but not as relieved as his mother. There's a difference. There's a difference between feeling relief that our hard-fighting troops make it home alive, the ones that do. There's a difference between us feeling that way and the son coming back from Afghanistan to his mother's home. What kind of relief is that for the mom? 
What happens? And some of you know what happens when your son or your daughter comes home from combat. I mean, the relief that they're alive. It's personal. It's real. It's not just, I'm glad our troops made it home safe. It's my son made it home safe. It's good news for you. I woke up the morning after Gabe's accident. He was asleep. And um, I just sat on his bed. I literally just sat on his bed and stared at him and thanked God that he was alive. It was good news to me that he was alive. Well, what Paul's doing here is he's saying the gospel isn't, the gospel isn't simply Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ for you. It's not just this sort of, you know, ethereal, objective. It's Jesus Christ for you. It's Jesus Christ delivered for you that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That Jesus, Jesus became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. In this sense, while the gospel is objective and outside of us, it's personal. It's good news for me. Jesus is the gospel because he is God for us. He is the incarnation of God's movement toward sinners. So it doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. Jesus says, you come to me. You come to me, I will lighten your load. You, you come to me. The gospel is God's announcement of good news to us. It's, it's easier, and you know this to be true, at least this is true for me. It's easier to believe the statement that God is love than it is to believe that God loves me. You know, one, one is um, sort of theoretical, to say that God is love. God is love. It's theoretical. To say that God loves me is personal. It's, for, for Jesus to say, I died for sinners, is good news. For Jesus to show up at my doorstep and say, I died for you, that's amazing. It has a different kind of impact, a saving impact. You see, knowing the mess that I am, it's difficult to believe that God's love for me is unconditional. It's so hard for me to believe that nothing I do or don't do can ever separate me from God's love. It's impossible to believe that. The idea that I can never out the coverage of God's love and forgiveness just seems too good to be true because my forgiveness, I know myself and I live with other people and know other people to know this, that my forgiveness has limits. You know, I intuitively know that there are some things I could do that could potentially forfeit the love of those who know me the most. I just, you know that, you know? You know that other people's love and forgiveness has limits. But the idea that God's love has no limits and it's directed to me personally blows my mind. In fact, it's so unbelievable that I have to be reminded of it every single day because it just seems too good to be true. So these, the subject of the gospel is Jesus, not you. The object of the gospel are sinners, like you, like me. Um, that the good news is outside of us, but it's delivered to us. The fact that even though the gospel is not about you or what you do, it is for you. The good news of what Jesus has done is freely offered to all without reservation, without limits. Let me just conclude with this. I was, um, I was putting Jenna. By the way, Gabe gets illustration airtime typically. Jenna gets illustration airtime typically. And lost in the middle is our most well-behaved child, Nathan. Okay? And I'm reminded of that from time to time. 
why don't you ever say anything about Nathan, you know? And um, I'm like, well, um, he's just so good, it's hard to come up with an illustration to illustrate badness, you know? Um, so I tried with one, with one stroke of the pen to remedy that problem, and I therefore dedicated my most recent book, One Way Love, you can read it on the front page, to my son Nathan, all right? So let's all just give Nate a hand clap. Where is he? Is he even here? Nathan, where are you? Oh, really? Nathan's gone, huh? <laughs> Sorry, buddy. I gave you some airtime and you weren't even here to hear it. <laughs> I found one thing he did bad. He skipped church today. I'll use that in an illustration next week. Um, anyway, um, so I was, so Jenna gets some airtime right now. Um, my, yes, Jenna, um, my youngest, the princess of our home. I was putting uh, Jenna to bed recently, and I asked her. We read the Jesus Storybook Bible uh, regularly when I put her to bed, and I asked her, honey, how do you think God feels about you? And her immediate response is very telling. Now, she lives with a preacher of the gospel, you know? I mean, if anyone should understand how God feels about her as a blood-bought child of God, it should be Jenna. And this was her response when I asked her, how do you think God feels about you? Her immediate response was disappointed. And I thought maybe she had done something stupid that she felt guilty about, so I probed a little, you know, um, and discovered it wasn't some internal conviction because of something specific she had done wrong. It's just that she sees God as someone whose feelings toward her are basically unhappy ones. And it makes sense because she knows that God is holy and that she is sinful. And so it only makes sense to her that God is perpetually displeased with her. Well, what about you? Honestly, not, don't give me the right answer, the Sunday school answer. I mean, honestly. I mean, in your, in your you know, dark night of the soul. What, I mean, how does God feel about you? How do you really think? God feels about you. Um, I think Jenna's answer reveals what probably most of us would say if we were honest, because we're aware of our sin. We're aware of our imperfections. We're aware of those things. And we're aware of God's perfection and his sinlessness. Well, Paul answers Jenna and me and you by saying, the good news is for you. Because of what Jesus came to do for you. God is well pleased. Not because of who you are or who you are becoming. God is well pleased because of what Jesus has done. You see, you are not what you do. It's Immanuel Kant, philosopher, for those who are interested. You are not what you do. You are what Jesus has done for you. And because of what Jesus has done for you, because he has given you everything you need to be right before God, God is well pleased. Jesus came for bad people, not good people. He came for the sick, not the healthy. He came for the unrighteous, not the righteous. He came for sinners. He invites sinners. He receives and loves sinners because the gospel is God's announcement that in the person of Jesus, the bad get the best, the worst inherit the wealth, and the slave becomes a son because of what he's done, not because of what we do. Let's pray together.